Wow. Good morning, everybody. Happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen. It is so good to be here. Oh my gosh, it's so good to see some new faces, some friendly old faces we haven't seen in a while. Not that their faces are old, but welcome to Emmanuel Baptist Church. We are so glad that you are here to celebrate this most important day on our calendar. Um, I don't know how many times my kids have asked me this week, is Easter the most important holiday? And every time I would say, well, yes, yes. It is. Like, not Christmas? Like, well, Christmas, as fun as it is, would just be another baby's birth with a lot of pomp and circumstance if it wasn't for today. So this is the most important day on our calendar, and I am so grateful I, had a ch- I have the chance to come and open up God's word with you. Um, I had mentioned to a few people in my family that, that I had the chance to speak on Easter Sunday, and both of them, the response was, oh, so is Pastor Greg going to be gone that day? So, so yes, he is, he's gone, but it, it's still a privilege to be here. <laughs> um, and he certainly would have uh, enjoyed and appreciated our decorations on stage, and it's just thank you for everybody who helped make this day what it is here at this church. So if you will, if you have your Bibles, please open them and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So open your Bibles or open it in your app or whatever you need to do, but open your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And as you're turning there, you know, a study of the resurrection could start in one of two ways. The first would be to try and answer the question, did it really happen? So looking at the events and trying to determine, is it true? The second way we could talk about the resurrection would be to attempt to answer the question, what is the significance of it? See, the leading facts in history are not bare facts in and of themselves. They are filled with living significance. Every historical event has other events that precede it, antecedents, if you will. And those events influence the event in question. And every historical event have, has events that follow it. We can call them consequences. If, and those consequences or results or whatever influence the way that we understand the event. So there really, there's a philosophy of facts. And no fact can really be understood unless it is seen within its meaning. So this morning, rather than trying to answer the question of did the resurrection happen, because we believe that it did, we've read the passages that were read earlier this morning, and we believe that God's word is true. And while there are many, many, many evidences that testify to the fact of it, we're not going to look at those today. Um, We are going to try and look at the questions of what is the significance of the resurrection in the life of a believer. So again, if you haven't turned in your Bibles already, turn to 1 Corinthians 15, uh, and we're going to look at a few of those uh, this morning. So pray with me before we begin here. Father, we come to you this day grateful that we get to celebrate this event in history. Not just because it is something that happened, but because it does have great significance for us as believers in Christ, and certainly great significance for people all around the world, even those who don't know you yet. And it is our desire that we would live our lives in light of the facts and the truth of the resurrection, that it would shape the way that we act and the way that we believe and the way that we look at life. And so, God, may your word 
speak to us this morning. Uh, for those who may not know you, may their eyes be opened to see and to understand your truth. For those of us who um, might be a little numb or callous to uh, the things that we've been taught over the years, may we see this event with new eyes today. And for all of us, God, may we get a chance to just worship you and to celebrate this wonderful event that proves that you are God and that you loved us and you died for our sins. You paid the penalty for our sins. So may my words be your words. And in Christ's name we pray, amen. So before we set our attention on the topic of the significance of the resurrection, which will be found primarily in verses 12 through 20 in chapter 15 there, I think it would be appropriate to start with really what is this gospel that we talk about? Why do we believe what we believe? What is it that we actually believe? And those are found early on in the chapter here of chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. So follow along with me. And I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, so your version may be a little different. Um, but 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4 says, I passed on to you what was most important and what has been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day just as the scripture said. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. And he was raised on the third day. That is the gospel. That is why we are here. And probably the hardest part of this little section, the most difficult thing to accept, is the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. You know, it would be interesting to note that in the following verses, Paul gives some evidence to the fact that the resurrection actually did happen. He addresses the question of, did it happen? By pointing out that Jesus was seen by more than 513 people after he rose from the dead. And that those eyewitnesses can testify to the fact that it is true, that it happened. But as I said, we're not going to discuss the proofs today. We're going to focus on the significance of these events in history and the implications it has for us, for our faith, and for our practice. So turn with me to verse 13 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and let's read that together. So verse 13 says, For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God. For we, for we have said that God raised Christ from the dead. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has, been not raised, has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless, and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Amen. So I'm going to give you just a, a little summary of this and what I call the SPR RV, the Stephen Paul Ruffner revised version. So if there is no resurrection at all, then Christ was not raised from the dead. And if Jesus was not raised from the dead, 
then we have some problems. But Jesus is risen, so don't worry. That, that's the SPR revised version of it right there. So the significance of this, Paul talks about them, and there are three, what I would call, problems that we would have if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. So if you're following along in your notes, you have some slots there, you might have to write really small. But I'm going to give you three problems that we would have if the resurrection is not true. And the first one is a religious problem. The second one is a theological problem. And the third one are practical problems. So let's look at the first one. Religious problems. Let's look back at verse 14 that says, If Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection from the dead. So the first problem is a religious one. One being that our preaching and your faith would be useless. Useless meaning it would be empty, it would be without basis, it would be futile, it would be in vain. In other words, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, what's the point? Why bother? For Paul and all of the other disciples of Jesus, to preach Christianity meant primarily to preach the resurrection. Read through the book of Acts, and every sermon that you'll see spoken there, you'll see that the resurrection is the central theme of it. The resurrection and all of its implications is the good news that Christianity brought to the world. But if Christ did not rise from the dead, then there is no good news. In fact, from a purely religious standpoint, Christianity makes no sense whatsoever without the resurrection. Think about it this way. Jesus, the head of this religious sect, walks throughout the Israel countryside talking about restoring God's kingdom. He gathers a pretty good following, including 12 pretty committed guys, because they all think that he's talking about overthrowing the oppressive Roman government and having a higher moral standard. At the same time, he makes some pretty bold and outrageous claims about being God and being able to rise from the dead. Eventually, the head of this sect is arrested under false charges, accused of blasphemy and sedition, and is brutally beaten and murdered by the state. The people closest to him go into hiding for fear that it could be their heads next. But you, if the resurrection wasn't true, but you should commit your life to this guy. Because, you know, even though his body has long since turned to dust, he said a few things about loving one another. And that's the reason why you should commit your life to him. Lots of other people have said purely wonderful things about how we should act in life. And all those people are dead and their bodies have turned to dust. And while there may be some truth there, we're not committing our life to this person or to this philosophy or to this thing because they're dead and gone. Christianity just doesn't hold up for what it calls us to do without the resurrection. From the perspective of a pastor or a speaker, talking about Christianity... And affirming the truth of the resurrection without uh, without affirming the truth of the resurrection 
It's kind of like, and I had to really stretch to come up with some, some analogies that fit my personality here, those of you who know me, but talking about Christianity without the resurrection is like talking about the Beatles without George Martin. Now, my wife said, who's that? So George Martin was the producer of the Beatles who made the Beatles sound, the Beatles sound. And without George Martin, the Beatles would have been just another British invasion band that sounded like all the rest. Christianity without the resurrection is like KFC without the 11 herbs and spices. It would just be chicken. Right? But the truth of the resurrection gives authenticity to the Christian faith. It proves that it is more than just a moral philosophy or a cultural identity or more than just a means to inner peace because any religion can do that. But without the resurrection, Christianity really is no better than listening to Dr. Wayne Dyer on PBS or Deepak Chopra or or Tony Robbins or Oprah Winfrey. Any sermon you hear on a Sunday morning or while driving in your car or while listening online or watching on YouTube is just a bunch of hot air if it doesn't have the resurrection at its core. From the perspective of the listener, again, what's the point? If the body of Jesus were to be found, then the world's largest religion would be revealed to be a sham. Jesus' claims about himself would be obviously false, and why would we want to follow somebody who is either a liar or a lunatic? As C.S. Lewis said, And so if a person can disprove the resurrection of Jesus, then they can prove that he was a liar and a con. And who would want to commit their life to a system based on lies? The bottom line is this. If Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, then we're just wasting our time. You should have slept in today. You should go out on the boat and do whatever else everybody else does on a Sunday morning. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. So the gospel is true. What Jesus said about himself is true. And our faith, it has value because we are not putting our faith in just something that we think to be true or that we hope might be true or gives us good values to go on, but we are putting our faith in something that is actually verifiably true. And so since Christ has been raised from the dead... We have a solution to that religious problem because our faith is not in vain. So the second problem that we would have is a theological problem. Let's look again at our passage in uh, chapter 15. Let's start at verse 17 here. And if Christ has not been raised then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. So again, let, two things to point out here that Paul talked about in, this, in these verses. And the first one is that if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then we are still guilty of our sin. The concept of mankind and how we can be freed from our imperfections, our sinful condition, though not all religions call it that, how we can be freed of this is something that is woven throughout all the world's major religions. 
But we don't have time to actually look into all the details of Hinduism or Buddhism or Islam or any of the others. But what really is the point, what's really important is that we need to look and understand what the Christian understanding of sin is. And most of us already know this, but the Bible says that we were created to know God personally, to have a relationship with him. But by our own choice, our own self-will, we have gone our own independent way. And that relationship with God was broken. The self-will is often categorized is often seen as an attitude of active rebellion or passive indifference. And that's evidence of what the Bible calls sin. The Bible says that we have all sinned. We all fall short of God's perfect standard. Back in the Old Testament, prophet Isaiah says, the trouble is that your sins have cut you off from God. And in Romans, the Apostle Paul says, the wages for our sin is death. What we have earned because of our sin is a death penalty that we are all under because we have all sinned against God. And there is nothing that we can do to redeem ourselves or get out from under this death penalty, which is why we need Jesus. Because Jesus said, I will pay your death penalty for you. I will die in your place and in my place. Well, he didn't say I will die in my place. He will die in our place. And by doing so, it can restore your relationship with God. And as a man, he lived a sinless life, and thus he was not under a death penalty. And as infinite God, he could pay for the death penalties of all of mankind. He died so that our sins could be forgiven. We just sang about this. He died to bear in our place the eternal punishment that sin deserves. And most of us, if not all of us, who are believers in the gospel, can grasp to some degree, an understanding of the saving truth of penal substitution that Christ offered himself up as a sacrifice to satisfy God's divine justice. But how do we know that it's true, that what Jesus said he could do, that he actually was able to do it? How do we know that Jesus could die and his death would pay for our sins. What proof do we have that Jesus' death actually paid our death penalty? Again, if I think of it in, 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 as an analogy, I could stand before you and say, when I die, David, I'm going to pay for your death penalty. My death will satisfy God's justice for your sin. Now, David knows me, and he can look at me and say, bro, when you die, the only death penalty you're paying for is your own, because you're under a death penalty too. And that would be true. But my words, you don't know that my words carry meaning. Or I could live a a fairly good life in front of you, in front of most people. And you might think, ah, well, he's a good guy. Yeah, sure, maybe he is perfect. Don't ask my wife, but yeah, maybe he is perfect. And he could pay for our death penalty. But still, there would be no proof that my death would do that for you. Another analogy I think of is I could go down to Walmart and declare to everybody in the store, hey, whatever you want today, it's on me. I'm paying for it. 
Don't worry, whatever you want. Just throw it in a cart and take it out. It's yours. Now, nobody in their right mind would actually load up a cart or two or three or four and just walk out the door with that cart. Because the security guards or the Xenia police would be there to arrest you before you even got it unloaded in the car. And go in and say, hey, well, you know, Steve Ruffner said that he was going to cover it for me. Because one look at my bank account and they would say, you know, you're going to need like a fourth stimulus check to pay for that, you know. I really have no proof that my claims would do any of that for you. At Walmart, you would need to see a paid in advance receipt to see that I could make that kind of claim. But that's what the resurrection did for us and for our faith. The resurrection is God's validation that the redemption paid by Jesus on the cross was accepted. It is proof that Jesus is who he said he is and that he could do what he said he could do. And if Jesus was not raised from the dead, we have no certainty of atonement. We have no certainty that God's justice was met. And as Paul says here, without the resurrection, we would still carry the guilt of our sin. There's a second theological problem in there, in, in this passage itself. And Paul says that those who have died believing in Christ are still dead. They're still lost. One of the greatest joys that we have, and one of the greatest hopes that we have as Christians, is the belief that death is not the end. When this life ends, we believe that Christians will be, reunited, will be reunited with other Christians who have died before us. Paul says, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. It is something more. Elsewhere, he says that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. But if, we, if what we believe is a bunch of lies, if we have no hope or assurance that our sins are paid for, if the person that we are trusting in is still himself lying dead in the ground, then what hope do we have to think that there is anything waiting for us in another life? There is none. If Jesus was not raised from the dead, then we have no reason to believe that there is anything beyond this life. And when we die, we become nothing more than plant fertilizer. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then we are out of luck. And that's our theological problem. Because our sins are still there, and we have no hope beyond this life. But in fact, Christ has been risen from the dead. So our sins can be forgiven. And we have hope for eternal life. Now there is a third problem that Paul talks about in this. And it's, our, it's, a, it's some practical problems. Let's read on here in verse 19. It says, And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. And we can turn over to 1 Peter 1, verse 3. And you don't have to turn there because it's up here on the screen. But Peter says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And now we live with great expectation. So the two problems that we have, the two practical problems we have, is that if the resurrection is not true, then we are to be pitied. The foolishness of the cross that Paul talks about at the beginning of the book of 1 Corinthians would be just that. It would be utter foolishness. The Christian life is a call to follow in the sufferings of Christ. That we are to expect suffering and persecution. That we serve an unseen God. The Christian life is a call to not live for the pleasures of this world, but to live sacrificially and to store up treasures in the next life in heaven. And I don't think we fully grasp this as 21st century Christians who live in the United States where it is still relatively commendable to be a person of faith and practice. But this was not the case for the first century Christians, especially those who were living in the pagan culture like the church in, at, there in Corinth. The challenges and the sacrifices that they faced were very real. Not that they're any less real for us, and the challenges are any less real for us, but we don't necessarily deal with it head on each and every day. But if the resurrection of Christ did not happen then why would anyone accept that kind of calling on their life? All of our sacrifices would really just be self-inflicted jokes for the world to laugh at. Those who live for the pleasures of this world would be absolutely right. Why not live a lifestyle for pleasure or wealth or power? Why would you care what it costs yourself? what it costs your family, or what the cost would be to other people. Live for the moment. They would be right in saying, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you may die. And pity anybody who chooses to live otherwise. If we as Christians are choosing to live this life of sacrifice that Christ has called us to, and the resurrection isn't true, we deserve to be laughed at because it's utter silliness. It's foolishness. And this is where 1 Peter 1 comes in. Again, it says, because the Father raised Jesus from the dead, we live with great expectation. Other translations say we have a living hope. Though we may endure pain and grief and suffering here on earth, because Christ's death was followed by his resurrection, we can know that such things are temporary, that much greater things await us. And so because we have this living hope for this life, we have a new perspective on life. The problem we have is if the resurrection isn't true, then our perspective on life is off. It's wrong. Because if Jesus was not raised from the dead, and this world was all that there was to live for, then the problems of this life are really, really big, and they're a big deal. Who doesn't want to live a life free from suffering? Or a life that's free from facing injustice? or dealing with racism, or having people slander you or wrongly accuse you? Who doesn't want a life that's free from insults or microaggressions or grief? And those are just the big things. All the other inconveniences of this life, pandemics, job losses, high gas prices, 
noisy neighbors. Dealing with all that stuff, small things or the big things, show us that this life really stinks sometimes. And how could you, how could we get over the death of a loved one? And when our son died a few years ago, I understood full well why grief so often le- leads to suicide or why marriages break up over things like that. And without understanding hope that results from the resurrection in Jesus Christ, it's easy for your perspective in life to get off. Paul later tells the Corinthian church that their affliction that they are facing, that their persecutions and their suffering is light and momentary. He says that it can be hard-pressed, but not crushed. He says that he's perplexed, but not in despair. He says that he's persecuted, but not abandoned. Or that he can be struck down, but not destroyed. How can Paul say this? Because he knows that this world is not his home. This world is not our home as followers of Christ. If we have a right perspective on this life, then anything that comes our way is something that we can handle through the power of Jesus. Because in light of all of eternity, this world is just a blip on the map of life. Any injustice or persecution or suffering we may face will soon pass. I mean, think about what the disciples did. After going into hiding when Jesus was crucified and locking themselves up into a room, this group of ragtag fishermen and and other lay people turned the world upside down. They went from being afraid for their lives to being the boldest people you would ever find. Why? Because they saw the resurrected Savior. Their perspective on this life completely changed. They went from being afraid for their life to not caring what happened with their life because talking about Jesus was that much more important. Think about what happened to the disciples. Peter was crucified upside down in Rome. Andrew, his brother, was beaten and tied to an X-shaped cross where he was left for two days before he died. Philip was crucified as well. Bartholomew was beaten, flayed, and crucified in Armenia. Thomas was pierced through with spears by four soldiers. Matthew was axed to death in Ethiopia. James was thrown off the temple and then clubbed to death at the age of 94. I think at the age of 94, you let things ride a little bit, you know, just go through them. But no, he was still bold talking about Jesus to the point they threw him off a building and beat him to death. Jude was also crucified. Simon was put to death. Matthias, the guy who replaced Judas, was stoned and beheaded. And Paul himself was beheaded. These men saw the risen Savior, and it changed them. They had a new perspective on what life was about and what was important. No one would choose to live or die like this for something that they know is a lie. But the resurrection of Jesus proved to them that they could handle whatever injustice came their way because they had hoped both in this life and for the life to come. 
So if Jesus did not rise again, then these disciples were fools, and all of us are too. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then we are fools. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. So because he lives, the gospel is true. Our faith has value. Our sins can be forgiven. We have hope of eternal life. And we have a new perspective on life. He is risen. And he is risen indeed. And I pray that we would all live in the understanding and the truth of our risen Savior. Father, thank you again that we can look at your word and that here we are, 2,000 years removed from this event, that we can still celebrate it. Thank you that because the resurrection is true, that there is meaning and purpose for us being here. Thank you because this is true, that our sins can be forgiven. Those of us who have put our trust in you, our sins have been forgiven. You have accepted that death on the cross as evidenced by him rising from the dead and, and triumphing over the grave. And thank you that we have a new perspective on life. That even though the world may pity us for what they don't understand, that we know the true value of this life and the life to come. And so thank you. Thank you, God, for rising from the dead so that we can have life with you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.